Hey guys, welcome to another CGS live stream. I'm Tyler, and today we're going to be continuing with this painting of the knight. I'm calling the white knight because he's got this fancy little white mask going on here. So yeah, hope you're having a good week here and hope you have fun. So let's dive in, shall we? So we were playing with the idea of having some sort of like runes, mysterious runes in this thing. I'd like to continue that idea in the shield here. We started to do it in the sword. We can see it's still pretty subtle here. I think subtle might be the right way to go. Let's just play around with a few shapes and just kind of gives ourselves a sense of how it might look. Excuse me. <laughs> Got some allergies going on over here. All right, so we can play with this bevel and boss slayer style here to give ourselves a sense of dimension to those. Let's make sure you're thinking about your light direction, of course. So, Wega? Sorry. Name's a little tough for me there. Hope I got that close enough.
one of my favorite tricks for adding some interesting colors is to select a very tight color range and then put that out on its own layer, play around with the hue saturation of that selection. And then we can further control what we see of that with the layer mask. And I wanted to get some interesting blues in here. So now we've got the whole thing. We've got blue happening everywhere, which is not something that we want, although I like a lot of what's going on here. Um, let's shift it to purple. Well, no, I like it a little more blue. Actually, that teal is looking pretty nice as well. Let's see. somewhere in that range works, but I don't want it on the cloth for sure. So yeah, let's add that layer mask. Fill it with black so we're getting rid of the entire thing. And now we can paint in with white on the layer mask to selectively reveal certain areas. Again, we're not going to put it on the cloth. Want to leave that feeling a bit more on the purple side. But I do want to bring in some of this in the metal areas for certain. See, it was hitting a lot of the highlights, which is interesting. And you could do this many times with different selection regions. You see some really nice things happening in there. We get some of those blues in that gold area. Similar to the way we think about values in two directions, right? If we want to make something feel dark, we can make it darker or we can make everything else around it lighter. We can do the same thing with color, right? We can, if we want to make something feel warmer, we can make everything around it cooler. If we want to bring out the yellows, we can add blues around it. So when you're looking at a piece in your life, gosh, I really want this to feel super rich in, in warmth and, and the gold to really pop, but I've used all the gold colors I can and it's still not rich enough. Well trick there is to surround it with the opposite. That's the only thing you have left, the only tool you have remaining to get it to pop more. Cool. All right, we're going to go ahead and merge that down now. I like that. But I did also like some of the uh, effects we were getting when this blue layer was a bit purple. I thought there was something interesting about that and teal, so let's let's do this again. Select color range. Let me grab a different region now. And you can see here how low, um, how small my selection region is, right? The slider is very far to the left. And we're grabbing just little bits of it. We're just sprinkling in some hue variation here. And if you're having trouble seeing it, if your selection is very small and you can't see what's going on, then uh, really just over boost the saturation until you get the color dialed in. I think if they're going for this kind of bluish purple color, then great. And then pull the saturation back down. That's gray. There's some of that blue coming in there. We can see some of those coming in. And so interestingly enough, that's giving us some blues here in the shadows that I think is uh, kind of neat. Kind of liking that. It's adding a bit of richness to the cloth here. I think there might be a little too much going on in this section. Let's see. Let me play around with that a bit. Yeah, 
sometimes you want to just zoom in and double check to see because there might be a few things happening that you won't notice at first glance. But honestly, I think a lot of that's working. Let's just go with it. And now we can zoom in and we can sample from this, right? We could see what was working, what was not working. For instance, if this area was just getting a little too blue, maybe we can paint back over that. But it's giving us some ideas rather than having to you know, manually go in and make a bunch of color choices. So it's kind of suggesting something to us and then we can riff off that. And that's kind of the same idea when people are using photos as part of their concept process. Um, at least when they're using them, I think, correctly, which is to say that they're not necessarily just um, leaving all these raw photos in the image, right? They're using it as a starting point, as a way to uh, springboard an idea. It's a similar mentality here. And I'm trying to make this cloth feel sort of uh, dry and more like a, like a linen or a, a cotton. So I don't want to go too shiny. I have to be careful about contrast that I'm introducing. Otherwise it'll start to feel like something else, like a silk or a satin or a... Right, so just be aware of that. When you guys are doing cloth, think about material type and think about the um, the way that the cloth might fold to. If it's a thinner material, we're going to have thinner folds, right? If we have a, a thicker material like wool, we're going to have bigger, stiffer folds.
sometimes you get a little layer mishap like that bit of cloth that went over the sword there so easy to fix That's kind of interesting. Some kind of uh, extra silhouette information up there. Yeah, I like that. a little bit of a contrast adjustment there as we're getting further in the piece you can start to get a bit more uh, broad with the value range uh, knowing kind of more fully what our lighting is going to end up being intensity of everything i'm going to play with subdividing this shape a bit and see how that feels bit of detail. So now we'll go in and give it some accents and solidify that change.
I reduce a little bit of the blue over here. I feel like it was maybe getting a bit heavy. Hey, Tiffany, how you doing? Contemplating whether I want light to be hitting that front there. I mean, they could justify that there's also justification for this shoulder pad occluding the light hitting the edge there but i like accenting it just a bit so here though i want this chin element to come forward more than this back shoulder so i'm gonna avoid having too much light hitting this line right here I do want to make sure the sword pops out, so I think we're going to force some of the rim lighting onto this here. We'll have it get occluded by the hand as it gets closer to the, uh, the grip section here, but I think as it comes down we can safely say that it might hit this edge. Awesome. Good to hear it. 
Hey, Zane. How's it going, sir? See, do we want the rim line all the way down here? Let's try it, see how it goes. Here's an easy way for us to do this, right? It's basically a line, so let's just put in a straight white line and see how we feel about it. Let's make this line a bit thinner here. Ooh, that wasn't really thin. <clears throat> here I'm just using the uh, contract selection feature too delete the few uh, delete a few pixels from the outside of the line fade it out there fade it out here okay yeah see it's just flattening the form a bit there but i feel like it's okay a bit of it hitting the top portion here. And the straightness of this line is also helping me see my swords inaccuracies. Make sure we clean that up too. sold on the light hitting this sword yet. I think it wants to be pretty subtle in that region there. Okay. I think I'm into that. You know, I am second guessing these runes now. I feel like it's just maybe too much, just too loud, right? There's a lot going on in the shape of the shield there. You know what? They're gone. <laughs> Say goodbye. It's just too much. My eyes just had too much to look at. There's a lot of shapes going on. It's a pretty complex suit of armor anyway. And we're taking some liberties here, right? This thing looks almost sci-fi in some areas, which is... That's what I'm intending. You know, I want the the White Knight to feel um, just a little bit mysterious in, in my fantasy world here. It's good to try and imagine a bit of narrative behind your characters when you're painting them, especially if you don't have something to work from. If you go into a piece and your only backstory is, I'm going to make something that looks neat. <laughs> That's uh, quite a challenge. Quite a challenge. Give yourself some constraints. You know, the constraints, while they don't sound fun, calling them constraints, they actually will help you quite a bit. Even something as simple as saying, a person needs to look like they're capable of defending themselves. Right? That's such a simple thing, but even that can be so helpful to your process. Or something like they need to look like they're really super intelligent. Right? Your mind immediately starts thinking about how can you solve that problem?
have a bit of ambient occlusion neglect going on back here. Don't neglect the shadow glue. some grunge to the bottom of this cape element here and even bringing in some holes I think would be fun. And we might make use of the lasso tool to help introduce some shape chaos here. I don't like having to premeditate all of these shapes when we're going for random. It's very difficult. Hey, Blasphemer, good to see you. sword. I think it's feeling a little flat. So let's introduce some gradient to that there. Yeah, there we go. That's agreeing a bit more with our overall lighting scheme. painting stuff live it gives you a new appreciation for Bob Ross because just take notice of how he really never pauses at all <laughs> during the show I mean, he has little tiny tiny moments of pause right where he explains something or whatever but he really never pauses uh, and it's testament to how much he sort of practiced show like you know this this thing here I haven't this is a new piece right I haven't like I don't know where I'm going with this <laughs> just kind of like doing it with you guys here live but um but on his show he would paint all of those paintings three times he would paint them first just in a conceptual way to just imagine what the piece was going to be then he would paint it again uh as sort of a refined version of that and then of course the third version would be the painting he would do live on tv um 
and that was all just so that he could ensure that he wouldn't have pauses and questions while he was working um, and that he could get it done within the time frame he had uh, time limit. I mean, you just think about that. No pauses. He has to always do the painting in a certain set of time. It's it's insane. <laughs> like, I mean, yes, it's totally possible for somebody to paint quickly and and uh, and predictably. But, you know, his consistency is is 100 percent. He has 100 percent consistency, which is um, you know, that's, that's what uh, practicing will do for you. Got some strange artifacts on the edges of this here. Let's get rid of that stuff. Oh, thanks. Glad you're liking it. It's not the most dynamic pose, right? But I was going for kind of a stoic quality uh, I think is good for a knight of his uh, demeanor Yes, Stephanie, it is. <laughs> it can be challenging for sure. But, you know, it's actually been really awesome for me, though, because um, having to try to, you know, reiterate these visual concepts to students uh, really helps me, you know, more thoroughly understand what it is that I'm thinking and, and what I'm doing. I'm, I'm, uh, I'm just more conscious of the choices I'm making and why I'm making them. And sometimes you'll talk through something you're doing and you'll realize that actually doesn't make a lot of sense. <laughs> then you have to rethink it. But I think that, that one of the toughest things is the stuff that is more on the intuitive side to explain some of the things that you're doing instinctually. It's like, well, why did you do that? Um, those can be a little tricky to explain sometimes. But as with everything, you do it more and you get better at it.
<laughs> hey, rush back. Welcome to the stream. Time for a liquid fix, friends. Feeling like that edge is just getting a little blobby on me. No blobby edges allowed. It's incredible what you can fix with the liquify tool. shadow in this area we're losing volume it's pretty back okay yep Thanks, Rushback. Of course, we're going to have some fog come in in front of the character, too, to add some extra depth to it, um, which I think will be neat. And we were playing around with the idea of this kind of a pendant. And I wonder if that... Is that do I like that? Is that too loud? that distract or is that cool i don't know maybe <laughs> not sure yet let's pop it in here and play around with it first let's give ourselves a little bit better shape going on in fact we could probably use the ellipse tool but i'm just gonna eyeball it for the moment and i was thinking about this being sort of a rounded shaped deal Now it's not really reflecting any of the colors of the environment, so let's bring in a few of those. That's still too dark. I guess we're going to have to go even brighter with it. or something. I mean, it just feels like it's kind of floating right now, but I'm sure there's a way we can solve that. Assuming we're going to go with this, I'm still not 100% sold on it. Can at least start giving it a bit of a cast shadow here. Okay, so there's our little floating pendenty thing. Gem. I mean, let's just let's move it around too. Why not, right? Let's just see how things look in different places. See, that's disruptive there. Let's move it off. Yeah, see, this kind of is a little bit of a visual milestone, right? It kind of draws our eye up from the sword into the base here. 
these are sometimes what I'll call points of interest POIs, right? They're like little, little stepping stones, little breadcrumbs through the image. This is how you guide the the eye through the pieces. These points of interest like this. Um, okay. Maybe this sort of comes up from over or from behind the cloak here. Connects down behind this. And some kind of little metal border framing the, uh, the jewel. I'm just using a flat black here so we can get the shape figured out. Thanks, Brian. Appreciate that. Yeah, you know, it's you got a character that's covered in metal, man. You got to really <laughs> make sure you're getting the metal to feel good. Um, so, yeah, I think that's definitely been one of my focuses with this one here. And it's funny because you zoom in and it looks like a lot of kind of nonsensical garbage, but it's all about that read from a distance, you know. Gold would make it even louder. I don't know that I want it to be quite that loud. Uh, yeah, Rushback, I am one of the concept art teachers at CGS. Well, it might be a little strong there, but I think I'm liking where this is going. I think it has some logic to how it's connected and it has a foundation now but it's it's really subtle so that we're not making it too loud because the gem itself is already quite loud among all the dark things we've got going on so we don't need to get too crazy with it let's merge those together and we've got a pendant working grunginess on there. Perhaps a suggestion of a couple links or something in the chain here. I mean, this is very minuscule detail. Getting a little excessive there. It's good to kind of take a step back and look at everything overall and just see, you know, is what I'm noodling on right now, is it really mattering to the piece overall or am I getting lost in a little section uh, that really isn't, isn't, um, saying a whole lot in terms of the entire piece like the links in the chain of the pendant there that's uh that's kind of excessive right so let's pull back recalibrate man okay what's next here keep kind of tinkering and whoops where are we at here i guess should we merge the pendant? I'm gonna leave the pendant separate, why not? I don't know. Never know. It might be that we want to tweak that a little bit more still, but I'm feeling pretty good about it. Just thinking about how much I want to bring in the shadow there. We gotta be careful too here because it's a white mask and we don't wanna make it too bright. But I wanna increase the darkness of the top of these eye slits here. Get that to punch a little bit more. Add a bit of scratches and dings to the fingers here. We don't want them to look too robotic. They're too clean. There's a kind of a robotic nature to armor plating anyway. And uh, so you have to be careful about the, um, 
the fitment of all the plates, right? If the fitment is feeling too precise, uh, you know, if we don't have enough, uh, enough texture, right? It could start to feel a little too sci-fi. Um, and this, again, this design is already feeling a bit sci-fi just because of the liberties I've taken with the, uh, the armor shape. So we have to be aware of that potential, um, suggest suggestion there let's get some cast shadow off of this cloth onto the body uh, Brian says good tip on stepping back I do photo retouching and sometimes without realizing I start editing pixels and realize after 15 minutes that literally no one will notice but me yeah no, absolutely. Same thing here, man. It's, uh, happens very easily, especially if you're sort of a detail monger like I am. I can get really lost in that stuff. Because the details are fun, too, right? You, like, kind of dig in and... It's like you've, you've created a shape and an, and an idea, and then getting in there and, and um working on the details feels like you're in your own little playground right you created a little island for you to have fun and it's a safe zone too like i think that's what also happens with details is that you start to focus in on an area that you like you you're enjoying that area so you're like oh okay let's go in there and let's keep working on that section because i'm loving that section and um what ends up happening in the process is number one, you potentially focus on things that don't matter. And number two, you neglect areas of the piece that you're having issues with. Um, this is super common, right? Where we're, we're like, yeah, that area, I don't really like what's happening. Let's not pay attention to that. Let's go somewhere else. And that, that part still did just kind of the, uh, further you get in the piece, the more you neglect those areas, you start to create this, uh, this real problem, right? And the problem becomes more apparent as you as you neglect it more. So that's another reason to step back too and, and just uh, try and identify those spots where you're ignoring them. So that means that you've got some problem you haven't figured out how to solve yet. Now, there's a little bit of a value puzzle here in the neck that I want to try to resolve as well. What was this layer doing? Oh, that was just a layer I was messing around with. Let's name this one Pendant so we don't lose track of that. And just so you guys know too, this Shield Mask layer, this is just a white layer. This is just so I can use it as a selection if I need to, to, to grab that shield. That's something you can do that's helpful sometimes is if you know that there's a big element in a piece that you might need to shade separately or, or mess with independently, just go in there and paint yourself a mask really quick. It can save you a lot of time. Assuming you have the shape fairly locked in, right? If you change the shape or manipulating it, then those masks become immediately irrelevant. So save that for when you know that you've got the shape fairly locked in. Yeah, the value puzzle here is uh, basically what's going on. It's from a distance. This is the dark. This is the edge that we read, right? Here's the cloak. Here's that dark line, which is not intended to be the neckline. And even viewers like you guys watching right now might think, oh, I, I thought that was the neckline, right? Because you don't know. I haven't explained that in my head. It's not. But there's nothing in the image that's helping you guys understand that that's not. So I have to solve that. That's a value puzzle I have to solve because I want the neckline to be somewhere in here. Is what, really what I want. Um, and so we have to figure out how to do that. And it could be that maybe we bring in a bit of lighter value in this section. All right, so there's one way we could potentially deal with that. Have to kind of bring in some darkness there to help it resolve. I mean, that I think might be the safest way to go. Let's just give it a bit of accent here so our eyes can catch this plate easier. All right, 
sure. I think that's working. It's definitely better than it was. What is the first step to becoming a good concept artist? Um, the first step is probably just observation, right? Like, um, just absorbing visual information from your environment, whether it's the things that are around you in real life or even what other artists are doing. Um, you know, when you realize you're interested in something, what's the first thing that you do, right? If you're interested in it, you, you start to research it. Um, even if it doesn't feel like quote unquote research, right? Um, a lot of things that are just interesting to us or feel fun to us when we immerse ourselves in that, it doesn't feel like research, right? Um, I mean, even something as weird as let's say what you love to do is you love to go bar hopping, right? <laughs> when you go bar hopping, you are researching bar hopping, right? <laughs> It's very strange to think of it that way, but like you are researching bars and bar culture, um, you know, the drinks that they serve, right? All that stuff you're, you're researching. Um, so your immersion in that field, in that environment is research. So, and, and you become an expert through that experience. So if concept art is your goal, immerse yourself, do the quote unquote research there and observe things. And then the second step really is then regurgitating what you've observed. So drawing from life, drawing from observation. And, uh, you can get quite far with just having a robust sketchbook of constant practice. I think those would definitely be the first steps because the other thing as you're, uh, immersing and, and, and learning is you're finding your taste too. Um, when you see really great concept art, it's always from somebody who has a very nuanced perspective on concept art. They've absorbed tons of it. And when they regurgitate their ideas, um, it is complex layers upon layers of complexity based on all of these nuances through their observation. Um, if you think about food critics, right? Um, a food critic who has only tasted, let's say, you know, a few restaurants, right? Maybe a couple fast food places, right? Their, their palate's really not that refined. They can't, their, uh, their ability to compare, right? Their point of comparison is very limited. Um, so what, what they might say is a good burger is not as refined as someone who would say eat at hundred restaurants or 500 restaurants. Um, so imagine yourself also as sort of like a food critic, right? You need to have the perspective of eating 500 burgers before you can safely say what is an excellent one or reproduce one that is going to be, uh, you know, delicious for a lot of people. Uh, you want to be creating delicious concept art. So there was my weird food analogy, but I love food analogies and I love music analogies. Those are two of my favorite analogy types. And my students, I think, can attest to that. But look, we all like listening to music and we all love eating food, right? So I think those are pretty good ones to use. Here's that song again that reminds me of Ventura Highway, <laughs> which is fine. It's a great song. Love it.
bar hopping in 2020 yes definitely not the greatest idea uh so yeah that's a good point now you made me hungry oh, i'm sorry about that i think i made myself hungry too what have i done feast on my delicious kind of spirit well i appreciate that but i'll tell you i can never feast on my own work because i always see all the problems <laughs> that's true of every artist right you always see the problems in your own work that's why i don't really hang up my own art in my house right i have other artists work in my house because i don't see the problems in there right? I, I just see how awesome it is there's only one piece i have of my own art hung in my house and it's just because it has some memories and stuff associated with it but other than that though i'm pretty uh pretty light on the um hanging my own stuff situation uh what's my go-to restaurant in socal oh my goodness there's so many good ones so many good ones and one of the things down here in socal is We've got just awesome Mexican food, man, because of our uh, locale, you know, we've got all of the, uh, you know, wonderful culture down here. And um, I mean, there's a lot of, I mean, we have awesome uh, Asian restaurants here too. Uh, it's a kind of a melting pot here in SoCal. And um, so there's a lot of good uh, ethnic cuisine. Um, yeah, I have a lot of, a lot of favorites. It's a really good sushi spot down here called Tokyo Table. Man, just delicious. Let's see now, if we weren't hungry before, now we're gonna start to get really hungry, right? I'm naming places, just remember. Hashtag not sponsored. to be darker over here in general i think let's see let's just put some of this kind of grungy nonsense over here and see how it feels yeah 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 that's working for me there we go Becoming a concept artist, what were some of your biggest frustrations with it as a whole? Was there a time you remember where everything started to click? Um, hmm. I don't know if there was a click moment. There's all these little clicks along the way, right? Um, nothing that really stands out to me as like a one big moment. Um, I mean, I think maybe the, if I could pinpoint one of the bigger realizations was, um, 
I had a, a chance to hang out with Paul Richards for a while. Uh, if you guys don't know who Paul Richards is, amazing concept artist. He's worked on Darksiders, on Overwatch, uh, on Torchlight. Um, yeah, just incredible and super cool guy. Uh, I had a chance to hang out with him for a bit there when he was down here in SoCal. And uh, he really opened my eyes to a lot of design principles, like ratios and hierarchies and, and um, you know, rhythms and things like that. Uh, when I started to think about that stuff, it really um, made it less of a mystery for me. So things started to, I think, unlock in terms of design for me after I <clears throat> hung out with him more. Um, it's one of the highlights, I think, that I can think of. Uh, and in terms of biggest frustrations as a whole, um, I guess it's just having an idea in your head that is more complex than what you are technically capable of which is a constant thing, right? Like, it's so easy to imagine something in your head that is epic or extremely dramatic or complex. Um, and then you go to execute, right? And you don't have the knowledge or the technical skills to get it where you need it. Um, it's just the translation from your brain to the page is, I think, just the fundamental frustration with all art. Right, uh, you see something in your mind, and then you have to figure out how to spell it out, and um, that's a, sort of a lifelong journey, really, to try to get that process as smooth as possible. <laughs> and yes, hanging my my house, hanging the having the, all my art on, on my walls in my house would feel petty. I agree. Yes, um, but hey, if if you're out there and you do that, that's okay too. No, this is the no judgment zone but yeah i just i just can't look at my own stuff too much because i just look at it and i go wow i could have uh could have painted that with a little more contrast over there or man those colors could have been a bit better over there all right let's accent this edge Appreciate you guys hanging out with me here. Um, you know, we're not doing anything super exciting. You can see this is like the kind of polish phase where we're noodling on this stuff. And so hopefully at least the commentary here and discussion is uh, fun on its own. Yeah, sometimes art is exciting to watch. Sometimes it's a little bit less exciting. It's not really a lot of, uh, a lot of control over that sometimes, but yeah, we're making it work. Is there some patterning maybe worth doing on the cloak or the cloth down here? Let's see. Like if there was some pattern or something going on there. Is that cool? Maybe. Let's see if that's... It might just be, again, too much detail everywhere. Yeah, well... Hmm. I mean, maybe we just go real subtle with it, right? It's kind of a secondary read. Some fun flow to that. I think we're going to leave that in. Just keep it really, really subtle. I can dig that. All right, let's bring in some blues into this gold here in the sword so we can add some richness overall. see that gold just a bit better. And then we can even put it over here in the shadow area. That's 
Another thing that Bob Ross did really well is he never got lost in the details too much. He's always making these big decisions. And those big decisions were really fun to watch. His, um, approach in general, I think, was very sort of viewer friendly. It's like things just kind of magically emerge. Okay, let's try something wacky here. Playing with the idea of having a colored light from below. Interesting. That's seeing how what colors might work in that case, how saturated to make it. Because the thing is, the piece overall has a certain kind of mood that it's giving with the palette, right? It's kind of a simple palette. It's it's um has kind of a minimalist quality to it. There's a cleanness to it. Um, so if we start adding a lot of this stuff, it might uh, destroy that quality. We have to be careful about it, the, the color mood. Um, but, you know, so that something that maybe something subtle like this blue here, I think, um, feels a bit more complementary to it and uh, is not a, quite as strong a choice, not as disruptive to the, to the mood as if we were to put in something like a red or a, like a neon green. <laughs> Michael Bay light flares, yeah, right? So, when we do this, we want to think about some logic behind the light. And make sure we're still thinking about ambient occlusion and the direction that it's coming from. But this is um, adding an extra dimension to the piece that I think could be really, really cool. And so let's bring in that light now into some of the cloak area.
<laughs> vaporwave night. I don't, is that a reference to something? You know who's a huge fan of this sort of a teal and gold compliment is Braum, who of course I'm a huge fan of. So uh, whenever I can borrow from like a Braum, a Braumism, I'm gonna do it. But yeah, I'm just as I'm putting it in here, I'm realizing yeah, that's something that he he really he really likes doing. Um, and I can see why. It's definitely has a fun effect going on. I mean, hell, let's see if they can even bring in a bit more turquoise into this stuff here. It's kind of down toward the bottom. Maybe there's some bounce light going on down here that's causing some of this stuff to happen. Play around with a few little flecks of extra turquoise here and there. Teal, whatever you want to call it. Peacock blue. Short for the Crayola Company. I haven't used crayons in eons. I don't even know, do they still call the colors like standard colors or do they try to be like appealing to all the, the younger kids? You know, like, uh, you know, whatever. Billie Eilish orange and Taylor Swift green. I don't know. <laughs> is that a thing? So this is all the sort of Michael Bayness that we've been bringing in here, which I think is definitely a cool touch. So we're going to merge that in and lock it in place. It's quite subtle. I, I'm just kind of considering, you know, do we want to maybe even go further with that? I don't know. know how I feel about that let's let's tinker with some other spots for a bit and I'll kind of uh, sit on it and see how I'm feeling one thing that I was noticing was an issue though was some value puzzle here readability of that sword against the background tone but we've got to blend it a bit because it's gonna feel forced In fact, that looks more natural anyway, so. Yeah, there we go. Cool. You're too old for Billie Eilish Orange. I, I know, me too, but that's okay. <laughs> you gotta stay a little current. <laughs> Billie Eilish Orange, what does that even mean? <laughs> I guess I could base it on like the person's favorite color or something, maybe, I guess. I want to do something with this edge here. I, just want, I, want, I want it to have a little bit of a extra pizzazz to it, but I'm not clear yet what I want to do with that edge. bit of blue there helps, but it's still, I don't know if it's enough. I 
and I'm talking through all these thoughts, right? You guys are seeing how much indecision and, and, and play there is there is that's happening. These are my favorite kind of pieces because they're just kind of creative and you don't really know where they're headed exactly. You can kind of just have fun with them. And uh, I think it's important that uh, you guys have some pieces that are like this that you guys are doing where you, you're experimenting, you're just kind of playing around and letting it evolve. And uh, I find these are the ones that tend to end up being kind of like the strongest, right? Because you're... Uh, you're trying new things you're kind of pushing yourself versus the ones that feel a little bit more sort of um you know methodical and and um and maybe even predictable uh or where the parameters are a bit more locked um you know that i think those are good challenges in their own way um yeah i like having a few of these going that are just more experimental and kind of play around with it and we don't we're not worried we're not gonna have somebody come in and say well i don't like that blue light that you put in there blue light doesn't make sense in this world this is our world right so we're gonna make all those choices ourselves Factory to me. Let's see what we can do about that. Bit of light cascading in there, perhaps. Okay, okay, that's kind of interesting. Yeah. Most times, you guys are going to have at least a couple areas of a piece that have some complex value puzzles to solve. I'm going to merge independent now. We're at that point where we can know that it's going to be totally fine. Just a tiny bit there. Yeah. And you want to squint your eyes too. You know, just kind of like blur everything out a bit. Helps you see the lighting and the values better. I'm actually thinking maybe we can get away with more value difference between the two. some artistic liberties happening there in terms of the light logic but i think just for the readability's sake i think we're going to want to stick with that so all right let's lock that in i need some light light glue in this section the ambient occlusion.
Okay. Let's add a little texture to this guy here. It's feeling super, super clean. Super green. Props to anybody who knows that reference. Evaluating whether I like this area here, just kind of dipping into shadow. I mean, there's a nice kind of V shape to this that I think has uh, gives some good uh, flow to the image. But um, do I want some more clarity on the shape here of the uh, character? Not sure about that. Uh, what was it that inspired you to become a concept artist? Um, Video games, I guess, would probably be the main one. Um, so yeah, I mean, I, I was... Uh, it's a series of things, I guess, over over time. So uh, growing up, I collected comic books, uh, like so many people in the field these days uh, started with comic books. Um, and, uh, you know, comic cards, uh, things like that. So that was like an opening into the world of art i think for me and i was always drawing a lot as a kid characters uh from my own sort of world imaginary world and um and then i got into magic the gathering uh which was sort of a transition from comic art into fantasy illustration uh, you know was always drawing through, through this whole whole process. Um, and then all along the way, of course, video games too. And at some point I connected the dots between video games, their sort of, you know, final state, you know, the playable state and, and the artwork needed at the front end of that process to get to the final product, right? That the development art. And when I sort of understood that, connection there uh, I think that was what really got me interested in that process um, when I went to art college I, I didn't really know about the specific feel a uh, specific jobs in the field uh, I, I just knew that you know games and film had art jobs um, but I didn't know the specifics I didn't know about the role of concept artists as clearly at that point um, and in college uh, opened my eyes up to the more specific roles and um it was one of my favorite parts of the process was the sort of original uh, or the uh, kind of origin points of the ideas where you have the person translating the their written descriptions into some kind of visual because i've always been kind of an idea person on kind of the more idea side of things um, i love world development 
and I love story. Um, and so the things that are more on the sort of back end, which is like some of the more technical things, doing things like animation and rigging and stuff like that, just it never quite captured me. Um, so yeah, I, I tended to lean more on the kind of conceptual side of things. Still a little bit of those runes left in the shield there, which I think is a fun, fun touch. I don't mind that. It was just a bit too loud and it's uh, full, full glory there. to have a bit more clarity between the uh, edge of the body and the cloak here i mean there's not a whole lot of like logical ways to solve that um in terms of the setup i've got i mean this is just surrounded by things that are sort of closing it off to the light so it's really this back edge here of this leg that i'm wanting there to be some clarity on and uh i don't really feel like it's worth trying to break the logic too much or introduce some other element just to get that one edge showing up the way I want there. I think it might just want to live, live in the zone that it's in. about that. oiliness almost to it that I'm appreciating.
turn that layer on and off. Take a look at that change there. Oops. these subdivisions come all the way through maybe and I wasn't wanting something more happening in this top edge here but I don't know if that's exactly what I want to do That's actually not working too bad. Huh. Let's turn that on and off and see how that's affecting things. Yeah, there's something kind of cool about that. Thanks, Rushback. It's definitely starting to come together here, I think. Got good eye on where it's headed. See if we can introduce some color variation into this cloth here. A few bits of yellow and maybe a bit more blue here and there. Let's turn off the fog so we don't let that affect our uh, value choices here. all working out in the end <laughs> uh, yeah it's a nice feeling when it's all coming together properly
got something kind of nice, a little more blue going on in there. stuff that people aren't going to notice but I feel like collectively a bit more shadowing on these runes might help them pop just a little more just a couple couple hits here and there okay yeah soft light gradient of blue to just pull the blue out more at the top and let's do another one or sorry at the bottom blue blue more at the bottom and then let's do some opposite at the top here where we bring in some warm So we have this sort of a slight hue transition from warm to cool across the character. I think that adds some extra depth to it. We can see it's off and on. And there's a kind of a richness that comes through in that. And then here's some of that uh, atmosphere coming in. So let's lock in all of those changes. We're getting really close, guys. Um, and we're almost done with the stream, too. So I think this is going to all sort of come together at just the right moment here, which is excellent. Let's auto levels the piece again and just see what Photoshop thinks our values are supposed to be. So yeah, we've got some, some range to play with there. And I pull this down and lock it to the night itself. We're gonna mask it, fill it with black. Well, we're gonna try to fill it with black here. There we go. Then we're gonna paint with a soft white brush and just reveal some areas that we wanna have pop a bit more. Because if we kill this, we can see how bright that gets. We only want that to be in certain areas. This section here. that layer turned on and off there's just a little expanded range in the hottest parts of the image that I think works well we can even adjust that opacity if we think it's a little too strong I'm gonna turn it down just a little bit so we don't blow it out too much
to play with the background color. So the thing is, I want to... Well, I don't want to play with that because... <laughs> this is the other thing is, just so you guys are aware, um, this is part of a series uh, that I'm doing. So I have... This is the, the last night in the series, actually. So I have uh, five nights that I've done. This is the fifth night. So I want them to be... I want there to be some consistency among them. And let's see, actually playing around with the brightness here. Let's see if I can, it's crazy how much the, the brightness of the background changes our perception of the, the character lighting. I mean, we've been working with the brightness at this level, so it's important that we keep that fairly true to what we've been working with there. Um, we can play around with it a little bit just to see what it might do. And if we go, of course, brighter, the silhouette of the character stands out a bit more, I think. I think I'm liking that change. Let's see. No. Nope. Yeah, I mean, dark is weird. Dark starts to make it feel inconsistent with the lighting, the uh, ambience. So, yeah, we're gonna do a slight brightness boost there. But anyway, so we can kind of show everything coming together here. Um, So we've got the Black Knight, uh, and, and yeah, we can, this is why we pull them off together, because we can see that the levels is just, they're just a bit higher contrast overall. I want there to be a consistency among them, so I think I am going to go just a bit stronger with the contrast there. Oh, and we've got to do our, uh, our sharpening as well, so we'll do a high pass on this. Lock it to only the tiniest little details, set that to overlay. And it just adds a nice kind of crispiness to everything. So the black knight, the white knight, the blue knight. That's the first one I did. You can see there's a little less detail on that one. The green knight and the red knights, uh, which was the one I just did. I just finished that one. Um, so that's a series of knights. Uh, if you guys are <clears throat> looking for like uh, inspiring uh, a way to kind of motivate yourself you can think about doing a series of images so that way the ones you've done before sort of give you some direction for the ones moving forward um, I think it's kind of fun these are going to be actually uh, I'll probably turn these into little character cards uh, a limited edition set of character cards that I'll uh, put on my uh, store envy page so if you guys are interested in that, uh, you can go pop over to my Instagram. I'll, I'll put a link in there when that's all put together. They'll be cool. I'm going to try to go something high quality, maybe even do some like gold edges on it. And then the back sides will have some stats, uh, just some kind of typical D&D stats, just for people who enjoy the stats and uh, seeing, uh, seeing a bit of more narrative uh, on the characters. It's something that I think is kind of fun to do. And, uh, and you can kind of use them in, in whatever way you want. Um, but yeah, that'll be kind of fun. I think uh, what we'll do next time uh, I'm here on the stream, whenever that is, um, we will uh, work on the UI for the backs of these collector cards. So it'll be a little bit of like, you know, approaching a UI design. So we'll, we'll have a kind of a unique challenge there, but I think a fun one. And our target goal will be to, again, be designing the backs of the cards and um it'll be a kind of a, a you know heavy gothic style uh, gothic fantasy style and it'll need to accommodate uh six stats the the six stats that you you see uh in um in a typical like dnd kind of setting right uh so we'll we'll kind of figure out a ui design for that and um yeah i think we could pretty much wrap it up there See if you guys have any comments. Uh, oh, uh, what was the filter adjustment that I used? Okay, so the filter adjustment there, um, it's it's the offset filter. So it's under filter other and then, or sorry, not offset, high pass. And what it does is it allows you to sort of isolate just the edges of the piece, uh, quote unquote edges. It's looking for areas of high contrast and low contrast, and it sort of isolates those. And then when you set that layer to overlay, what it does is it sort of uh, enhances those edges of a piece. 
and it just gives everything a, a bit of a tightness, uh, enhances a bit of the texture. Uh, digital art tends to feel sort of soft and airbrushy uh, many times, which is why uh, you'll see concept artists really like to have brushes that have a little extra kind of texture and noise to them. You don't want to get crazy with it, but uh, I think it's nice to have a bit of that going on. It just prevents your art from having too much of a digital feel to it. And, um, you know, I might go in and just do a few little tweaks after the stream here, just maybe add a few other little textures or something and just a little bit of cleanup. But I think we can pretty much say that that one's, uh, that one's good to go. And uh, overall, very pleased with how all of these turned out. It's, uh, it's been a fun adventure. And, uh, and of course, the one on the left here, the Black Knight, uh, there's actually a tutorial video if you guys are interested to see a breakdown of that process uh, from start to finish. Uh, go check out the content for CGS. Uh, I think that's on our uh, LinkedIn. I think it was on there. Um, should be easy to find. If not, you can uh, reach out and uh, We'll get you a link for that but anyway stay tuned to the channel uh, for other awesome mentors and discussions here art related stuff uh it's happening all throughout the week so uh, again thank you guys for joining me and uh well, see you guys next time all right take care bye bye <laughs>